welcome to episode 49 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This month I had the pleasure of speaking to Psalm 1 and Angel from the group Big Selkie. Psalm 1 is an educator, organizer, artist, author, hip-hop artist, and so much more. Psalm's memoir will be out later this year. Angel is an organizer, artist, yogi, hip-hop artist, founder of the Shift Cooperative, and much more. As Big Selkie, they have three amazing albums out. Check the show notes for the link. In this episode, Psalm and Angel talk about the Shift Cooperative, mutual aid, organizing, lessons learned, and music. Thank you to Awareness for the music, and here's a short jingle from a fellow Channel Zero Network member. Ransom notes. Anarchist and anti-authoritarian music podcast. That's going to come out every month. Ransom what? So what's like, I mean, what's your like ultimate goal, I guess, in the end of the Rising up against the oppressor. The attitude that you see in hip-hop. Let me uh, give you a sample of some of the uh, lyrics that had some of the older ladies among the stockholders quite with dismay. Go to ransomnotes.libsyn.com or get them from the Channel Zero Network. Okay, so my my first question is for is for both of you, and it's it's kind of about when you had a transformational moment when you started looking deeper at the propaganda of U.S. society, maybe seeing through, you know, it's a process. Maybe you saw through different lenses of white supremacy or colonialism, patriarchy, and kind of when you started digging deeper into that. And I know, Psalm, you had said in the first interview, which was, I think, 2019, that around like Hug Life and Flight of the Wig is where you started becoming more like politically framed with your music. But I was wondering, like, if there's like an earlier time in your life when you started digging deeper into breaking down these propagandas in society? Well, my mom was big on Black literature growing up. So I read, you know, the Baldwins and read Malcolm X's, you know, you know, the the major players in like Black politics and Black movements from like back in the day. I was made aware through my mom's books, but think because of my upbringing and my education, you kind of become immersed in a world that you think that that's what the safety is, you know, like, especially academia, you can become very um, sheltered from radicalization, so to speak, you know, depend, it just depends on where you are. And for me, uh, being a chemistry major, I, you know, I was basically just on that had so I kind of just got the whole like working class for you know especially being black it's like we're told that like being part of the working class is part of the big goal you know what I mean just being treated properly and treated fairly enough to gain employment you know that's the hump you know we're taught that we just should be so grateful for that I I think I was like many radicalized as a youth, but then through academia and and actually going to schools where I was a token black person in a lot of uh, situations, I became numb to some of those some of those thoughts. But yeah, in 2019 uh, and and even with, um, you know, hug life realizing some of the classes, things that I noticed when I lived in San Francisco and then also the patriarchy of hip hop that I kind of touch on in Flight of the Wig, but with the Big Silky projects um, by Big Silky 2, we I was re-radicalized through the uh, George Floyd uprisings. And that kind of like cracked open some of my latent, <laughs> you know, some of my latent ideas that I learned as a, as a kid. And just some of the things I thought as a kid uh, being bust from my neighborhood in Inglewood to a high park or to an uptown or to a downtown where I'm seeing people just live way different than my family did. So thank you. Thanks for breaking that down. And Angel. Well, I come from a mixed family. My dad's black, my mom's white. And while I experienced a lot of kind of like on the outskirts of the family racism, I didn't really become radicalized until 
I would say maybe 12 or 13, I had an experience uh, where the police kicked in my door and like pulled guns on my family and my, my dad and me and my siblings. And I have the benefit of being lighter skinned. So I had never experienced anything like that. That was probably the first time I realized I wasn't safe. Uh, skin color, like socioeconomic background became a thing like, wow, we're poor and this is okay for them to do because we're poor and they're police. And then I really put it out of my mind for a very long time. And I was also re-radicalized during the Floyd uprisings because I think all of the trauma from things I experienced with police growing up and through my younger life and maybe even into teens and early adulthood, uh, I had pushed down trying to just make it through. I love that Crystal uh, Sam touched on it being like getting a job because that's kind of like where my parents focus was too. Like they're not very radical. Uh, my mom, in fact, is just now starting to read all of these books like Zeal, uh, Zora Neale Hurston and like mm-hmm. James Baldwin and her mind is getting blown because she didn't know any of these things back in the day. So she couldn't teach me and my dad the same way. You know, he couldn't really show me how to be radical or, or what having pride in being a black person was. So when you come to Minneapolis and it's a traditionally white city and then something like George Floyd happens and we all see it on camera and we see it's murder, it was really hard for me to just hold that in and not look back at everything that I knew um, and had experienced. Yeah, because, you know, even here in Minneapolis, I mean, Chicago, I mean, there's so many kids even back through the 90s, Yummy Sandifer, that always stood stood out in my mind. And then moving here with like Philando Castile, that was a... Yeah, and it was like, I was was here, I was already like kind of like bouncing back and forth between Chicago and Minneapolis during these things. And even, you know, helped out you know, just in little ways, like taking firewood to encampments or people occupying the precinct with Jamar Clark. I remember taking like water and firewood up there with my homie. But that those are things that I help the movement. But, you know, kind of taking up the these topics in, in our art uh, was something we felt was just absolutely critical because we were just it, it, it just was a wild it was a wild summer, man. <laughs> and, and, and also just the, it's the epicenter of a, a new civil rights movement. Yeah. Like it, it truly is. Like I know that the world is partaking in this right now. Yeah. But, but, George but, Floyd, it's, but yeah. it happened here. And, yeah. and there was there was a different energy here mm-hmm. when you, when when you have a city who has watched a murder and then everything burns like people burned a police precinct. That's, That's unheard of. <laughs> That's unheard of. When you really think, sit down and think about that, you know, it's like, yo, they literally went up there. Yes. And, and they were, and they were, um, sorry, they did ahead. that. They did that. That was poignant. It was you history. Know? You know, so it, for, and that, and that's an understatement, you know, cause I, we're, we're removed. The pandemic really uh, was, a, was that back, you know, the backdrop to all that. It just, rest in peace, George Floyd. Um, I think yeah. the pandemic was a catalyst to, the possibility for real change, but it also was an eye opener for a lot of people, specifically white people who saw Obama get elected and thought to themselves, racism's over. Right. We have a black president. We have a black first lady and are unwilling to look at all of the, for lack of a better word, bullshit that's surrounding the image of America. When a black president doesn't mean black people are, are somehow are safe, yeah yeah are free yeah. are supported because and, and it doesn't mean white people are either and yeah. I think that is something that people uh, are starting to wake up to start, exactly and, and was missing before you know understanding that it's not just black folks who are poor it's not just brown folks who are poor <laughs> yeah abolition would help any everyone Every, everyone <laughs> benefits from you know a defunded police department everyone benefits from yeah. uh, universal health care like everyone benefits from free education yeah. it, it's it's not a maybe <laughs> it's a definite you know um so putting that in the music i think when we got to that point in volume two was it either put up or shut up like what's what's what are you, what are you making art for 
at this point. Well, we were just so vocal online too. So it was a natural progression to put a lot of those bigger thoughts into song. Yeah, it's it's so powerful and it, it militant, but also just like educates as well. So it's just such powerful art. And thanks for sharing all that. And just the the legacy of of protest movements and like liberation movements in Minnesota is so deep too. Like it's also where the American Indian movement started. And yeah, you all just talked about so much like the energy shift as well. Like when whole like Eurocentric or white supremacy was being questioned is even in places like Denver, all around the country, they were knocking down statues as well, which was really powerful after Mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd, like Columbus statues going down, which was awesome to see. Yeah. And I was wondering if y'all had any any comments on that, just like that whole shift and and even how prison abolition, which had been being talked about since the 70s, but just increased so much. Minnesota took it to a world stage. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, we we sat all summer with with abolitionists and shared ideas because we didn't we're artists. Right. We don't claim to be activists. We don't claim to be organizers. We've done some activism work. We've done some organizing, but we're artists, you know, and we were and we're also like we don't consider ourselves, you know, political artists at all. Like I've never called myself a conscious rapper or political uh, rapper. So we did a lot of like, you know, people overuse this term a lot. We did a lot of listening and learning. And we also did a lot of saying things that we thought people were saying. I mean, I remember Angel sitting in on a city council meeting in, I think, like uh, July or August 2020 and called them racist. They were treating Angel like they were like Malcolm X or something. They got just me off. They, said, they got, me, they got just, me off of that. And they got me out of there quick. Just because Angel said, y'all racist, it was like, oh, my God, this is the most political shit ever and it was like wait no this is just facts you know so I think that there were Minnesota is very interesting because there's so much racism here but no one wants to claim it there's a lot of progressive there's about a lot of progression here for like for the for the trans community for like white gays there's a lot of progression when it comes to healthcare here and things of that nature but when it comes to racial racism, classism, any of that, like being able to say things that people, a lot of people here are, are scared to say, not, not, not saying um, the abolitionist movements here and the organizers here, because that's where you find some of the most pure and, you know, innovative ideas around organizing. A lot of people that are not in charge are, are coming up with some of the most radical and interesting ways to fight the system as it were. But overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, there's a majority of people here of all races who kind of just want to fit in and, and go, go along. So there's no problems because we saw how much racial strife is here. There's so many cover-ups here. There's so much like nastiness in the police department all the way up the chain. We saw our mayor just straight up lie. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a beautiful moment where he got booed when <laughs> Jacob Fry got, got booed, booed out, of a protest. out of the protest, you know, that was wonderful, but he got reelected. So what the hell are we even doing? You know what I'm saying? So um, we definitely have a long way to go as far as like boosting the, the signals that need to be boosted and really getting people on board with radical change, because if not, it's just going to be these incremental Two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, it's like a Band-Aid, you know, like the Band-Aid's it's just a gaping wound. And, you know, like you can't really put Band-Aids on it at this point. Mm-hmm. So and it's a very it, and it's a, you know, microcosm here of what's going on in, in America. Like we saw January 6th here and you know what I mean? Yeah. Beforehand, we, we saw January 6th <laughs> in the days after the uprising. Yeah. Like, we are our city burned to the ground. Yeah. You know that January 6th was a tiny piece of that and that's because white people felt like their power was being taken and they wanted to demonstrate that we are not the only ones who can organize and also what we saw here that that property is definitely more important than people than than people here i mean it was a target no one cares like we saw we literally saw people going to clean up target after the protest, like, why are you going to clean up Target? (laughs) They actually have a whole ass company that comes in here that gets paid to do it. 
you're trying to prove a point being like they tore up the target for black people we're gonna yeah. clean it up not, like what even. like what but there there's being statements made that are just so unnecessary and so ignorant you know yes so i'm yes. sorry go ahead angel no i you just brought up the target and i'm like the target wouldn't have even burned down had they just opened the Helped doors the protesters they, they have opened the doors to the protesters who had just been violently tear gassed by the mpd so it's like they made a choice as a company to say like for fuck the people yeah like fuck our customers fuck the people we don't care y'all can't have this milk so yeah you had to go you know like this is that what we saw here was a, a small piece of what is happening everywhere in America and everywhere around the world. And the fact that a lot of people didn't really know what was really going on in many Minneapolis and, and St. Paul, like just the, the whole area, like, you know, even as close as Chicago, I'm talking to my mom, talking to my cousins and aunts. And they're like, wait, that happened. Like, they're not showing us that here, you know, and it's like, man, this is like two states away. Yeah. And we have all the technology in the world. How come y'all don't know that this happened? Yeah. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, we realize just how corrupt everything and is. Everything yeah, is, you I, know? So. You say that, and I distinctly remember um, reporters trying to cover things up until they were getting tear gas, too. <laughs> and then they couldn't understand. I, I w- remember watching the video of them laying down at the gas station, and the woman was like, who are they shooting at? And they're like, they're shooting at us. <laughs> and they were like, oh. Like, they're shooting at us, but we're press. Like, yeah, because you're showing the truth, and that's not allowed. Like, the truth is, I mean, they say the truth will set you free, right? Like, in these cases, it really will. It opens people's eyes. Oh, I think the press opened everyone's eyes. Thanks for sharing those experiences. And, and, yeah, I know just so many people lost eyes, and a lot of reporters lost their eyes by getting shot mm-hmm. with these rounds and it was so violent and, mm-hmm. and, and they're was, not non-lethal but you know that's another mm-hmm. thing i don't want to keep going down certain like little points but it's like that was a lie too like you could die yeah. from those rubber bullets depending yeah. on how close range it was and these the, you know a lot of the police were shooting people at close range with rubber bullets you know so like that can can be fatal you know and, and you're right it was hard to know what was going on i and also the level of surveillance that happened. I had a friend in Minnesota, and if he wasn't one of texting me and telling me all the surveillance that had started, mm-hmm. and then if it wasn't for Unicorn Riot, who was doing like, mm-hmm. a live yeah. stream, I wouldn't have known what was going on either. Unicorn Riot, big shout out to that whole team, because a lot of people here in Minneapolis wouldn't know, yeah. you know? And I just appreciate everybody who like who like put their lives on the line, really, to 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 show you know, what really uh, was going on. And speaking of surveillance, we had a couple, you know, we don't want to talk too much about it, but it's like we had a couple really scary nights here at our crib. So we even got cameras that summer, summer you know, we upped our own surveillance yeah. that summer because we we're like, wait, what the hell is going on? Like, what is that car? Mm-hmm. What are these shells doing around my yard? Why police outside why, my house. Why are they shining lights in my window? Like that, all that shit is so scary, especially for people who are like, you know, <laughs> we were, we didn't, we're, we didn't do anything. But also, you know what I mean? we're, we're, but also we're artists, yeah, right? So, yeah. The, so this, so it's like when you think about why that's happening, right? We went out. And we don't. I'm, I'm not a front line protester that's not my space that's not the space i feel is my space but i will show up i will uh, write numbers i will donate money i will and get we'll out clean there. up the aftermath yes, and I'll, bring pampers and yes, water i'll and get food. out there and take we'll, food we'll, and we'll water that, yeah. but when it's when you're doing something just in and then to me that's a small you know so when you're doing something small like that like just looking out for the community doing patrols yeah you walking know, around yeah, doing, that. doing yeah. stuff like that and then next thing you know, you see the police shining lights in your window or they're now coming up your block when they've never come up your block before. Literally or just from in front of your helping house. the neighborhood out in the aftermath or of just protests. your tweets. Yeah. It really shows you that like they're watching, they're watching everything. And if they have a chance, they'll do whatever they can. And when we're seeing it with people like Winston Smith, mm-hmm. like a, a, a very open protester mm-hmm. who what, gets shot up in a parking garage and nobody no has body on. cams. Nobody mm-hmm. has, no, has no footage. There's no cameras around, even though there's cameras all over that parking garage. Mm. That doesn't make sense. You know? So it, it really tells me that 
the whole system is corrupt. Yeah, so yeah, throw the whole thing away. How do you like you know even going back up to to Congress? How do you pass a George Floyd like law? And and then you give more money to the police. Yeah, it's a slap in the face. It, it's a dead slap in the face. And 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 also seeing the militarization of Minneapolis happen, like where in the aftermath of that, it's like when the Derek Chauvin verdict was coming down, they occupied Minneapolis with tanks, army tanks, yeah, for like a week before just to like prepare for a possible uprising with, you know, the the verdict coming out. Yeah. And that was scary because it's like you driving down the street and see a, and fucking, you see tank. a fucking tank and you're like, where's the war? Yeah. Oh, the war's on us. <laughs> oh, got it, got it, got right? it. Right. And, and you see these kids in the National Guard that are like kids and they hate it, you know? You know, yeah. walking by, get, going to the you know, the grocery store and you see like a 19 year old in full military regalia yeah. with a fucking AR-15 looking at looking at you and can't even really look you in the eye because they don't understand it either. Yeah. And then you see these kids on the other on the other side who are willing to fight and die for mm-hmm. their beliefs, you know, mm-hmm. like these kids who are like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to protest until they shoot me. Mm-hmm. Or until I go to jail, like because it's something. Because it because it's their life on the line. Mm-hmm. It's their their freedom on the line. You know, it's it's the dream we've all been sold that that we're we're all equal and that we all have the same rights and we all have the the right to life. It doesn't seem like that when that's not what they show us. Yeah, and white people feel protected too a lot of times, and it's like I think these times are showing that the cops are not for y'all either but you know what i'm saying there are uh, yeah. uh, obviously karens out there that can cry and get the cops called but like there are like you know people always like to say oh they kill more white people cops kill more white well there's more people so if you just do the balance sheet on there yes uh, black people are killed black and brown people are killed disproportionately more than white people but there are more white people here so mm-hmm. Of course, that's going to those numbers are going to shake out like that. The cops are not here for us. Yeah. You know what I mean? So and there's a war on poor. Yeah. So there's a lot but of also poor white. people in this country who can't fight, who can't fight the system. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we had a homie that ended up getting arrested during the protests. And he, you know, he comes from, you know, a little bit of money like his his parents had money, but they had to strain everything. Um, to help him beat the case. And all he was doing, again, was helping protect the neighborhood. All he did was put out a fire. Yep, that's all he did. And, you know, he's fighting the case for years after that. Yes. Jeez. I would also just like to say... Go ahead, Angel. Sorry, just before we go on, Mm -hmm. like, one thing when Sam said that about, like, white people being killed, too, like, yes, they are. And if white people would, like, look at other white people getting killed they would understand that they could mobilize together too. It's not just- It's about, not a race thing. It's not a race thing. It's, <laughs> it's become a class thing. And I wish like white folks would understand that they were duped mm-hmm. many, 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 many years ago. Yeah. Like all those four or 500 years ago. Down, you know? Yet they were duped too into thinking that whiteness protected them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not their fault. It's white plus money. Yes. They, they, they no, just no, forgot but, to say that. No, exactly. But it's like white folks with money duped white folks who were poor, who were sharecropping, who were on the outskirts and, and used race as the weapon. Mm-hmm. So like if white people could understand that too, then they could literally stop like being racist. They could unlearn that racism. They could learn to love their own people, you know, and, and look out for each other as well as us. Like, Racism is baked into American soil, though, so it's really like yeah. <laughs> the whole reason we're here is, you know, a group of people being like, yeah, we're better than y'all. And then now we have America. <laughs> <sighs> you know, we're still yeah. we're still unpacking a lot of this stuff, you know, and being able to speak about it now, you know, a couple years removed is uh, is also necessary because I think that a lot of movements and a lot of things fail because of fatigue and people think it's going to be instant change. And while some radical changes happen here, people start to forget, people start to revise, people start to question. People even question what they saw with their own eyes. 
You know, I know people who got COVID and still was like, man, I just still think it's a hoax. It's like, no, it was a, definitely a scam. Like COVID was a scam, but it's real. You know what I mean? People are definitely getting sick. People are definitely dying. You know what I mean? Still. But, you know, COVID definitely was um, given to us in the American way, which is just like big scam energy, you know, figuring out how much we can make off COVID while scaring the shit out of everybody. But it's still absolutely here and it's real. Yeah. And I, I kind of saw that falling into how America so tied into like invested in Western thought that it sees things in such binaries that it had difficulty separating science from authority mm. and just kind of really understanding like what COVID is. But yeah, of course, these pharmaceutical companies are going to make millions off of it too. Yeah, real quick, you know. Uh, so like building off of what you all said last, like when the Chauvin trial came, I know there was like 20 million or something set aside and just that whole dichotomy of how there wasn't money for uh, stimmy checks, but then right. you can put 20 million to Chauvin to protect the city and the state pulls out its tanks. Like you can really just see a lot of those uh, contradictions that the state really just exposes itself with, which what you all are talking about. It was, uh, you know, while we're asking our friends, supporters and family members to donate, you know, so we can go get groceries because there's no grocery stores in our neighborhood. So now, you know, you know, there's a lot of people in our neighborhoods like who they use, like we, we're privileged. We can go to any grocery store we want, but like there's a lot of families in this neighborhood who like the grocery store burns down. Now they don't know where to get food. Yes. Like that's sometimes that's the only grocery store within, mm. within the neighborhood. Yep. You know, which it was. It was. It I mean, was. They, built it, they built it back up. Thank God. But like there were months there where like <laughs> yeah, there, there was, was no time. pharmacy, there was no grocery store. And like that's that's calculated. And uh, honestly, black people don't do that to their own neighborhood. But the, I don't want to get too far into <laughs> the Floyd conspiracies. But, you know, we don't we don't burn down grocery stores and pharmacies you know there is some looting that happens because people are fucking poor yeah you know like what are you talking about like the reason people even broke into that target was because they needed milk and water from getting tear gas but once yeah. the door is open of course somebody gonna be coming out with a tv at some point you know what i mean and let's be real like, it, let's wasn't, be honest. it wasn't just black people it either definitely wasn't just well there's no white people in minneapolis That's what I'm so let's just I'm saying. the numbers don't add up that yeah. it was only black people in the target no hell no nah. it was everybody yeah well since the from the george floyd murder this is when uh, angel you started a shift cooperative i was wondering if you could talk more about shift and the work that you all and some do with what it is and what you're doing with it absolutely so when the uprisings happened we saw that there was a need for like some said groceries there was a need for transportation there was a need for financial security and we have platforms so we've I, we both felt like it was our responsibility to use our platforms for something good in the midst of turmoil. So we started by just saying, hey, I'm, I'm taking donations. When we made Big Silky 2 and we said well, that, that first, the yeah, first we, chunk of sales was going to go right back to yeah, the community. Yeah. And so we made uh, like, like $2,000 or something off that. Mm -hmm. And then we made like another 4000 in donations. And then you had another platform. And then used. I had, yeah, I had an OnlyFans. Yeah. And I said, look, I'm going to sell this ass on OnlyFans. Y'all can come see these pictures of my ass and watch me rap. And I made like $1,200 and donated all of that. And then spending like, what, six days or something? Yeah, been probably a week we raised almost $8,000. Wow. Um, and we gave it all back. Mm -hmm. we, we, we gave families kept, money we literally kept no money i have spreadsheets for, <laughs> for yeah. all the receipts. it was wild too because it was like the band camp fridays happened and it just oh, like yeah. happened to fall yeah during the the uprisings and everybody was feeling you know generous and, and guilty yeah. so 
that was like one of the best Bank yes. Camp Fridays I ever had. I was like, of course I'm going to have one of my biggest sales day when I'm not keeping any of the money. Yeah. I mean, and God, I think God is funny that way. I think yeah. the universe is funny that way. We definitely know? gave away more money than we actually had. Um, and I think that that was the beginning of... That was of, a be- definitely the beginning mm-hmm. of shit. Yeah. And um, so we did that work when the uprisings happened and then... Although this isn't, um, so then the Me Too movement happened here as well. And we opened our doors for survivors. Um, just full transparency, I'm a survivor. Um, Same. Uh, so I felt compelled to do that work as well. And so at this point, we're donating like money, we're doing groceries, we're taking like diapers, we're transporting food. Yeah, um, going on mad grocery store runs yes i'm taking like i'm like sitting in in my in my house with survivors like five six seven different uh, people and having conversations about like how to make this a safer scene and then it started to dawn on me like yo like <laughs> this is like work that just has to continue and then somebody randomly gave me like 13 bikes and i was just like okay this is a huge donation what do we do with it? And out of all of that, out of all of the money and the the work and the in-person work and the bikes, we started shift. We said, you know, we're going to give these bikes away. We're going to fix them all up. We're going to continue to donate money. We'll, we'll do disaster relief, continue to provide groceries and clothes and shoes mm-hmm. and support in any way that we can. And in July, uh, shift was born. But we didn't have we didn't have we didn't have the um the paperwork. For yeah, it. and our friend we yeah we had a friend who basically was like, "How much money did y'all give away?" And we told her, and then she was like, "This is America. You're gonna you're gonna get taxed on that. Yeah, you you might want to think about starting uh, a nonprofit if if this is work you want to continue to do, mm-hmm. um, which it is. I have always been active in community work. I've always been active with kids. I've always done yeah. We, you know, I did the. We did rhyme school. Yeah. Like for, for me, like I, I started rhyme school in like 2013 with my own money and before even Chicago Public Schools gave me any money. And it was yeah. just trying to be a good role model for kids and neighborhoods I grew up in because, you know, rappers don't usually show the, the working class rapper, the woman rapper, the rapper who doesn't isn't going to, you know, steal, kill and destroy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we we've, we've always been big on like the youth and big on, you know, doing stuff in the community, doing stuff for the community. So it's just a natural progression. But, you know, when we got the, the, we the good advice. Yep, and we applied for, yeah. we applied for our nonprofit in July. We got notified in September that it was ours. Yeah. Um, but we never stopped doing the work, which is why I truly believe that it, it is working because yes. we, we were waiting, you know, I was like, look, if I get taxed, I'm t- I'm t- getting yeah, taxed. Yeah, we're just gonna it get taxed. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like I'll just eat the I'll eat it. And thankfully, you know, I was able to get my 501c3 status in September, and I can now get more money and give out more opportunities. And uh, since then, we've gone from bikes for green green transportation and mm-hmm. disaster relief into. Uh, sustainable yeah. wellness. Yeah, we wellness. we just launched. Well, we just closed the chapter on a yoga program where we gave free meditation and free yoga classes out to people in our community. And last summer we did a, we did a, a, a huge yoga three day well. event where it was like uh, offering things like meditation, yoga, uh, sound bowls, sound bowl healing, just, yeah. just, just things that will help people in our community just chill yeah be at peace but also heal. even for yeah even for even for 30 minutes you know and um we we realize that there's a complete there's a void you know in the black community specifically because we're we were taught by the our boomer uh elders that like all that stuff was anything that wasn't of jesus was of was demonic you know what i mean but so a lot of people shied away from things like therapy meditation even things like yoga you know what i'm saying so um uh, un- breaking down those barriers and breaking down those walls and re-educating our community on these just wellness practices and it becomes spiritual if you if you allow it to but it doesn't it doesn't it's it's not just one religion or 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 even any religion if you want it if you don't want it to be this is about tapping back into yourself 
uh, centering yourself, even in the midst of turmoil and chaos. You know, we we definitely became closer um, with our within ourselves during the pandemic and through during these uprisings. So Angel has done a fantastic job with uh, bringing wellness to shift. And I'm going to allow them to expound on that because I definitely just took over the combo with that. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that when we are protesting, uh, rest and healing can also be a form of resistance. Me and Sam used to take these bike rides, these long ass bike rides last summer. And I remember biking one day and these two white women were also on the trail and they stood right in our way and refused to move until I like literally had to say, get out of the way. And it, it almost like, it actually like did make me cry. And I just thought to myself, like, why do we have to fight in every space to be seen? Which is riding um, bikes. <laughs> just riding, yeah, riding bikes on a, on a fucking free trail. And they were standing in the bike lane. And they were in the bike path, standing <laughs> on both sides. It was, just, it, was, it was obnoxious. And it really shifted the way I think about health and access. mindfulness and yeah, mindfulness and access to healing. You know, like, I'm fortunate that I work at a studio where anyone can access it. I work at the only black studio, only black hip hop studio in Minneapolis. Yoga studio. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, yeah that's what I mean. It's the only black hip hop yoga studio in Minneapolis. And it's only $15 a class. Oh, Even wow. to go to uh, many studios start at $25. $25. Or, sometimes yeah. that's like, Sometimes that's a meal for people. Sometimes that's dinner for that's people. Some of us meals all day for some. Yeah. Like so ha- not having access in a time where like the city's burning, where there is a protest every day, where there are black people being murdered all the time, not just by police, but by random acts of violence. Like gun violence is wild right now. People are getting kidnapped. Like girls go missing all the time. So like I really feel. That because our bodies hold on to trauma, there has to be something out there for us to help us release and build community. And you have to feel safe in order to be com- build community. And then in order to release, you also have to feel safe and comfortable. So shift is starting to head into like sustainable wellness and uh, sustainable opportunities where we can grow our own food and we can uh, teach our kids and we can have community to look out for one another. And it all really came out of just raising money and giving it away. Yeah, getting and bikes, that, fixing them up and giving them away. Yeah, and, and everything, like, I know a lot of nonprofit, I know the nonprofit industrial complex is under fire right now. <laughs> I'm very aware. <laughs> as soon it. as we became a nonprofit, we were like, fuck nonprofits. We are yeah. like, damn, we're just trying to give away some money. And I, and I absolutely understand why. Because there are- People get greedy as hell. There, there is no reason, like, nonprofit executive directors should be making, like, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars And that's, and that's, and that's- that's happened so often. It happens all you know? the time. Um, I just want to make it clear: we don't make any money. We don't take. We, <laughs> we don't, don't get, take we don't salary. Make any money. We don't take salaries. Yeah. I do this work. Sam does this work because we love it. Like we love it, and we, we see want, a, and we see a need. If we didn't see a need, we wouldn't be doing and it. And we see a change. Yeah. I see. I see the way. It helps. Look, I was out here putting books in book boxes the other day and I had a little girl come up to me. Uh, little, we'll say her name is Desiree. I don't want to put her name out there because sure, she's safety. Um, but like so Desiree sees us putting books in the box and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm filling up book boxes. She's like, can I have some books? I'm like, girl, take them all. You can have whatever you want. She takes them all and then she brings back three other girls, you know? And <laughs> right. then I see two other girls the other day who are like, you gave us all those books and all those clothes. Do you have any more? Hell yeah, I got more. Like, I'll give you whatever you need because I got extra. I got it. Mm-hmm. Like, we all got it. There should be no reason that we're hoarding it. And, and, and that goes on all levels. We can't criticize the Jeff Bezos and the Kim Kardashians. And then we hoard every little thing too. Mm-hmm. We have to share them too. They should be sharing the most because they're, they're fucking rich. They're billionaires, which shouldn't even be a thing, mm-hmm. but we have to share too. Like why, I, I didn't have like just keeping it a buck when we started ship. I didn't have uh, money in my bank to pay taxes. I didn't have money to like do certain shit. I was 
hoping to make it just like the rest of us on these stimmy checks, you know, Mm -hmm. on unemployment, trying to save every penny I could while also like donating all the money I could to it's it's we have to look out for one another like that's the basis of a lot of shit in life if we don't we're all gonna fail as a species like just we we're gonna fail as a species if we don't get it together yeah and i i really think just that that solidarity not charity that you bring to it and the mutual aid is such a healing force to kind of create anti-hoarding mentality when you see there is mutual aid, it heals others, maybe in their individualistic or capitalist mind state. And I really love that you have accessible healing in inside a shift co-op as one of like the foundations of it. And I was wondering if you could maybe share like another transformational story of, of shift and just doing it, being out in communities. I really saw a change in the survivor work that we did because right during the shift, during like the beginning of shift, we realized that a lot of the artists kind of getting on their soapboxes and pulling out their um, bullhorns to talk about defunding the police and, you know, killer cops. It was hard for a lot of femme body people and women identifying people here to see some people that were, have been abusive taking these leadership roles. A lot of artists, let's just keep it a buck. A lot of artists, they turn political corners because it gets them more attention. Sometimes artists start to do charity work or community work because their name's not really popping in the streets. I think the beauty of what Angel and I do, we don't care if our name is popping in the streets. So we don't use the music, we don't use the music, uh, the community work to try to boost our music careers. And um, for me, a lot of things came full circle during that summer where we were, we were able to say, we help artists here. We use our funds to give to people in need. We actually hold space for survivors. We, we opened our DMs. We opened our backyard. We opened our, our, our hearts to dozens of women who had terrible stories about local artists and we we stand with survivors and we also know that some people put extra sauce on their stories and embellish and things like that but there's like two percent of people who lie about stuff like that so we're we're dealing with systemic oppression even within hip-hop when you talk about patriarchy and rape culture so while all of these things were going on we saw i was able to see a change in people's um, perception of me because, you know, I, I expressed my concerns and, and, and qualms and negative events with rhyme sayers in 2015. And then in 2020, during all of this, during the uprisings, during, during the pandemic and all these things happening, this came, my story came back around. And it was the people that we had been holding space for in shift with shift. It was the fact that people saw us out um, helping the community, even talking about things on our platform. And I think people, people gave my story a lot more credence and, and it was becoming more true in their eyes because in the five years since they saw what I went through and there was a lot, and I was and I was not scared anymore. I felt I had true community here in Minneapolis where when when we first got here, I, I felt I felt almost like a target. But then I found my community, I found my tribe. So it was transformative for me because through the community work and people who weren't really in the music scene per se, they were, they were community members and people with real lives and You know, they don't do the clout chasing shit. People that are really affected by by things that happen in the music scene here. I think that was a transformational moment for me personally, because I realized that the community really is what strengthens individuals to start any sort of action. I don't want to call everything a movement because that dilutes, you know, the actual term. But I do feel that we had a lot of momentum with what we were what we were saying 
And then also it checked out with what we were doing because a lot of people talk about community, this community, that. But they don't but they, be out here. They don't really be out here. And they're then they'll, they'll make a $25 donation and then they'll act like they're fucking, you know, like some some huge organizer or something. Which it's, also $25 does matter. But, no, no, no. But. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I'm saying they there'll be people who could actually give more, that's but they'll the give they'll give do. something little and then they'll they'll act like they did like yeah. this great movement work. Yeah. You know, they embellish it and and for us, it's not like, oh, look at what we're doing. It's more like we're doing this and then we're also still doing music, you know. And I think all of that started to kind of feed feed each other. And that's why we were able to even come up with Big Silky 3, because that was in the aftermath of a lot of things yeah. where we were starting to look towards the future and seeing, you know, the seeing beyond the rubble, because a lot of things burn down here existentially as well as physically. I also want to add that I think um, all of the community around Shift gave Black women strength. We're not the only ones, but I think a lot of the survivor work and the willingness to say what we mean and to be unafraid. Like have one, thing, one thing about me, I don't care if people don't like me. I used to, but I don't give a shit no more. Like, <laughs> And all of that like has come from me having to go through my own traumas as a woman and and then speaking up and being ostracized yeah, yeah and exactly alienated speaking up against anything and being shut down especially against men um especially against rappers popular rappers um, they don't popular people or not, don't like to be popular, talked about but it's like or popular or not exposed for their bad doings yes you know? and and the reality is like accountability like people shouldn't be thrown away but they should have to be accountable. Like everyone deserves yeah. to heal. My work is not to heal uh, abusers. That's my personal preference. It's not my job. Yeah, we're but there are survivors. but there are people who will do that work. Yeah, absolutely, there are people who will do that work. And if you're accountable, then you have the space to grow through that trauma. I think holding so much space for survivors in 2020 really opened the door for women in Minneapolis to say what they mean. And I say black women specifically because. Black women were speaking up in Minneapolis mm -hmm. for years yeah. prior to the Me Too movement mm -hmm. here. Nobody cared no one until that. white women spoke up here. Mm -hmm. And then when white women spoke up, we spoke up at, in support of them. Yeah. And we also spoke up in support of the black women who had been speaking out for many years. Yeah. Like some, like a couple other women. We don't mm -hmm. need to name anybody for survivors protections, but there are, there are, there is a strength in knowing you have other powerful black women behind you mm -hmm. holding you up when you are a black woman. And when you're ready to speak about what's happened to you and what hurts you, it sucks when you look around and you only see people who don't look like you uh, of, of receiving grace mm -hmm. and receiving compassion. Mm -hmm. And, and th that goes into, you know, white supremacy. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, while white women are not the enemy, they're still white women. And when we see Karens, which is like something that was born out of the pandemic through racism, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that is something that doesn't go away, you know, so just to add that. In. Thank you so much for sharing those stories and it's powerful and thanks for what you all do. It's inspiring and it's just powerful. So thank you. And if I had another question about shift, I just wonder if you could share some some learning lessons you've had from shift, maybe give some advice to someone trying to start up or embed with an ongoing mutual aid project like shift. My learning lessons are, oh, this is a good one. OK, so one thing I've learned is you don't get to pick and choose who you help. Everybody needs help. Right. You can't you can't isolate and while our focus at Shift is people of color, uh, Black people specifically, I have lots of folks of all different races who come to my pop-ups to get food, to get clothing, to get shoes for their kids, to get shoes for themselves, you know, just household necessities, PPE when we had it. And it was a lesson for me to not become an oppressor. Oftentimes what I see is, hurt people hurt people, right? Like that's a saying for a reason. And 
it's easy to look at all the trauma we've experienced and hold on to it and then use it in return when we have the opportunity. So that was a big lesson for me to be compassionate, to be understanding, to know that I don't know everything about everyone's plight. And we all have a plight. We all have a struggle that we're going through. Um, now, you obviously can't come up to shift if you're driving like a Benz and you're, you got, you're done. Like, you can't come up and take stuff if you're just fucking bawling. That's not how it works. But you can come if you're white, if, you, if you're poor, you're, you know, you're welcome in my space. So that's something I really had to learn, um, not to let my traumas dictate my treatment of others mm. and if and anyone who wants to start a nonprofit or do mutual aid be patient know that like it's not going to happen overnight it takes a lot of work and to surround yourself with people that you trust that believe in your mission that will fight with you that will fight with you to get the right things done because I know that all of my idea, my ideas are not the end all be all. And I have a board that will push back on me. So I, if you're going to do it, do it, you know, take the leap and do it. Don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to, but do it. Keep your records, keep a, a good list of your records. And just like I said, to begin above all, just be patient with yourself. Give yourself grace. Yeah. Thank you. It really increased my time management because I have a lot of other things going on. So for, for me being able to understand that, like, okay, we're doing a shift event. I'm going to have to clear my schedule to make sure that it goes the way that it should go. Um, my grandmother taught me back in the day that never give somebody something that you wouldn't want yourself. So we make it a point to like, if we're collecting bikes and we take like a couple of weeks to collect bikes and make sure that they're good bikes that we can even use them and fix them up. Same with clothes. If we spend a couple of weeks collecting donations of, of, of the week, we like to say gently loved clothes. Like we still go through them and we still go to an industrial laundromat and wash and, and make sure that these, these clothes, these clothes are, are good for people. So if we're giving them to you, like this, it's going to be clean. It's going to smell good. And it's going to be ready to wear. Even with the food, we, we try to make sure this is food that we would want to eat ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. like we, I remember we got a generous donation from Trader, from Trader Joe's um, for one of our events. And people kept coming up like, dang, you got almond milk. Dang, you got the good chicken. It was like, yes, like because this should not be such a luxury for everyone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so for me, it's about making sure that when you give, you give things that you, you yourself would want and also to clear your schedule. You know, if you've got a lot of things going on, like compartmentalize and, and, and orga be organized, you know, organizing, it's in the word, you know, and I think a lot of people don't understand that we don't like to throw stuff together. We've been event planners as just rappers who do our own shows anyway. So we come with kind of a skill set that helps with the events that we we do, the pop-up markets. And when we partner with other organizations to do community events and things, I think that we are able to run successful events because of being organized and because of also being meticulous about the things that we, what, that we give. I love that. Thank you. And Angel, when you said that hurt people hurt people, that really reminded me of a, that's something that Bill Hooks said a lot. And rest in peace to Bill Hooks. And mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about your, your newest track, Barishnikov. And Angel, you give a shout out to Bill Hooks on that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Angel read All About Love and basically was on a tirade for every anyone around them to read All About Love. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so admittedly, uh, that's my first Bell Hooks book. And I'm glad it was. I had to read it because I did a trauma-informed training. When everything was happening with survivors, I noticed that everyone was giving their opinions and there was a lot of trauma dumping going on. There was a on. lot of misuse of 
uh, language. Yes, as well. yeah. but it was a lot of trauma dumping going on. Mm-hmm. And when you hold space for people, you don't dump your own trauma on them. You don't relate your stories to theirs. That's not helpful. Oftentimes people need to get things out and they're not looking for a way to connect. They're looking for a way to release. So that led me to this trauma-informed training. And Bell Hooks was one of the books we had to read. And I have to say it changed my life. It, It really did. Like understanding how to love myself in a way that doesn't take away from anyone else's love for me, loving others in a way that's compassionate, that's encouraging, that is vulnerable. We all want to be heard. We all want to be cared for. We all want to be understood. But I think as humans, we struggle to give that. And I think that's a societal thing. Um, We are lacking love for ourselves. We're lacking love for each other. And I feel like, I don't want to get it wrong, but Bell Hooks mentions love being a verb, not uh, not something you say in, in Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like she mentions it being an action rather than just something you throw around willy nilly. And when I heard that, it really changed the way that I perceive love and how I want to give love to other people and just how I want to treat people, too. What we're socialized to believe love is isn't really what love is. It's not blind loyalty. It's yeah. not. It's, it's not, not for, you... and it's not forgiveness in the way that we think about forgiveness. And yeah. love isn't uh, you can love someone and not fuck with them at all. But lo- loving them is lo- loving yourself and understanding the dynamic isn't healthy, you know. And that's just one example. But yeah, we're definitely people don't know what love is. People don't know what love feels like. But people use the the word all the time. And even though it's it's it can be very subjective, I've been shown more love with the community that we built in the last two years than the hip hop community that I'd known prior because that love is different and it's superficial and it's, it is based on my talents and my skills, but it's also based on my proximity to success. Right. So a lot of community members in music will treat you a certain way because you got something that they didn't get yet. Mm -hmm. Whereas the community that we built, the last few years here has been, it's literally been based on what can I add? What can I give? What can I offer? And I think that is a fundamental difference. And that, that shows love. Love is, you know, what you can give in spite of the circumstances, you know, and, and it has nothing to do with sex or power, or anything like that. You know, it, the, the power is in the love. Yeah. I don't want to get too, uh, <laughs> too deep into the definition of love because I don't have it. <laughs> well, I had to look it up because I wanted to make sure I had it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Bell hooks. And I feel like she defined it from Eric, from someone else. Oh, uh, Eric from Fromm. Eric Fromm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it was love as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own mm-hmm. or another's spiritual growth, mm-hmm. which blew my mind because it made me think like, damn, how do I contribute to other people's growth now? Mm-hmm. How do I create sustainable opportunities, even in just my personal intimate relationships? How do I create space for the evolution of myself and the evolution of others? And how do I consistently do that? And how do we make the space safe for that? Because yes, for everyone. Well, in, even in like a, you know, a regular, like, uh, you know, even a, just a normal two-person relationship, romantic or otherwise, sometimes people get threatened by another's elevation, evolution, growth, Mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. But you, you know, knowing that the, this version of angel that I love is not the version that I loved in 2015. You know what I mean? This is a different version. Same with me that if you love Psalm today, this is a different Psalm Mm -hmm. than you loved three years ago. I'm different and giving people the space to grow and the opportunity to love another version of them is another layer of love that I think some, some people, you know, they grow apart. You don't have to growth isn't linear, you know? And yeah. and so, and, and people aren't supposed to grow in the same ways. People can have similarities. There are lessons that I'm learning now that some people learned 10 years ago. Some people learned as a kid, you know? Yeah. And so that sort of growth, 
should be nurtured and people should feel safe in their spaces to do so. And that, and I think that's what we, we try to do and we don't always get it right, but you know, we definitely try to hold space for people that we don't, we try to even hold space for people we don't particularly care for. Cause I think that that's, that's a huge part of community and loving people within your community too. Every, you're not even going to like everybody that you share community I'll with, say. you know, but you should have a common respect and like be able to be in community with them, even if you don't necessarily like care for them so much, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of it as well. And you can't really get to that, that place before you do a lot of internal work. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's deep. I love seems to go outside of linear time too. Like it doesn't obey any linear things and another thing with love i see with you all is listening too and just giving people like seeing people like on anxious nervous and imperfect psalm how you honor the the legacy of black women who pioneered the quote great shit in music or (laughs) on mcnothing angel you you say uh, we protect black women on these sides trans women are women on these sides and you all talk about doing patrols and protecting communities as well and Mm-hmm. Big Silky's love. <laughs> yeah, you really, we really, honestly, I would not be the person I am now without all of the love I received here in Minneapolis. Uh, when I left Chicago in 2017, I did not feel loved by myself, by the community, by my peers, by God. I didn't feel loved. And I found peace here. In, in the safety of, of friends, of new new friends, mm-hmm. of, of friends who are no longer friends. Right. Of God, of grace. I found my own connection to spirit, to myself. I, I'm in love with myself these days. Like I, I, I treasure myself as a, a person of value. And I treasure the people around me as, as valuable in, in so many ways. So I, I definitely owe... Minneapolis and the, I would say the last two years to exponential growth for me. I could not be this human without it. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. Are there any other last things that you would like to add, like where people could find Shift or find you all? Yes. Okay. So um, <laughs> you, can, shift, shift, shift first. you can find Shift at the shiftcooperative.com. Um, we are transitioning into some bigger opportunities. So we're very quiet right now. um, And that's for a a good reason. Um, But there's more coming and be excited about it. Wait on it. You're a part of it. And we also have a big silky show coming up. Our first show in Uh, two years. First show in the panty. Um, It is uh, in support of Air Credits, who are a dope, dope, dope ass Chuck and, and Steve from Hood Internet. Yep. Um, and they're dropping a record. No, their record's already out. This is the release. But this is the release yeah. show, right? Yeah, this the album is called Believe That You're Here. Yep. And, and um, you know, you can find all three big silky volumes and Barishnikov at Psalm1.bandcamp.com. And everything except for Barishnikov is streaming. Spotify, all those big corporate streamers, it's on there. Big Silky has a dollar sign. For the S. But also just to f- we're supporting them on April 30th. Yep. At, at the bottle. empty bottle. <laughs> You're good. I don't want to talk about it. No, it's okay. I was like, you saw the big silky in the but I was like, but we didn't say the show yet. Exactly. Um, but we're supporting air credits at empty bottle on April 30th. Tickets are only ten dollars. So d- please don't ask us for no list. <laughs> Anybody listening, please uh, support us. Understand that we are artists and we are sensitive about our shit. And we deserve that little ten dollars because it makes it makes up, it adds up. And uh, empty bottle is in Chicago, so if you're not in the Chicago area, maybe want to take a road trip. Maybe you want to take a six hour drive or a one hour flight. If, if you're from us. Minneapolis, if you're from anywhere else in the world, you still can come. Uh, you just have to pay for you know your transportation. Come, <laughs> come holler at us in Chicago on April thirty. Yeah. It's big silky, bitch. Let's come clean. My foot on they necks. I've been.
been planting seeds, reading coats and hooks in bed at night. Come let me set the scene. Eating good pussy, drinking Cabernet and smoking weed. Chasing purpose, fuck your profit. This off top, it ain't no game. Clips stay loaded, no, I don't control none. God gon' make a way. I've been rapping all these years and finally got some shit to say. Ain't no bench now that can hold me. If you with me, then you go. Then I got heart. Niggas know it. I done sparked too many moments. Neil told me I was humble. Watch me shake the whole persona. I'm a diva and a omen. No, I got it from my mama. I ain't with the drama. I don't got the patience. If it's meant for me, you know I gotta take it. Ain't no conversations. I'm applying pressure. Diamonds all around. We making niggas better, 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 better. Watch what you speak about. Karma blowing on the wind now. Only working with intention. Culminate a vision I could never miss now. I just blossom with the grid. Ow. Energy up in the crib. Wow. The aura feeling like a gift. Power brewing all up in the mix now. Stop me calling me a champion. Y'all know she not bragging. It's that magic everybody on my all to pop out when i landed this big silky kid is that filthy shit smoking super glue and plotting on these options i commit everybody on my dick i can't see you unless you're riding for all new number i can't pick up the car i've been balling on the low my my business finish whipping i ain't fucking with y'all never tell them for you finish the mission shawty want my kisses off a of commission i've been told them little bigots good riddance every now and then i buck at them bitches not that je ne sais quoi i don't mean to piss you off mikhail barishnikov gliding through the mist and fog i dance through end zones fuck your tempo grab the tempo high potential mind your mental i get crystal like this shit's on fire what you doing with your life no i can't really be your wife the juice the blend the truth be them don't move too friendly stop it i choose these ends the means within i push that product on go that bitch is me that shit one free i fall like elder tubman Yeah, we both got heat, but over here these ones I buzz some. Fuck they mind set up, then Kizzy vanish like a vape hit. Don't let nothing moon, you ain't gon' see me like a rape kit. Ain't that petty? I stand with survivors till they dead me. Nobody eat like me, I act like mama never fed me ice. Oh yeah, I can help you make your video. Really? Yes, this is what I do. Well, you're also a principal, so. Yeah, yeah, but this is my art. I write, I edit, I direct, I do the music, I lip sync. Because of me, when people say that their favorite director is that Ava lady, somebody else gotta be like, which one? <laughs> That was a new single from Big Silky titled Barishnikov. Look for the link in the show notes. I want to thank Psalm and Angel for spending some time to speak with me. Please support their music on Bandcamp. Follow them on social media. Please donate to the Shift Cooperative for all the important work they're doing. Thank you to Awareness for the music. and see you next time.